On this Friday night, the agonizing wait for COVID-19 tests and results. We're, we're short on lab technicians. And the potential breakthrough that could clear some of the backlogs as three provinces bring in more restrictions. A global national reality check on Ottawa's child care plans, the potential price tag and the timeline. An Ontario man accused of faking terrorism, chilling confessions that police say were false. And Canadians in Australia on life in lockdown. I don't want to say it's prison-like. What's happening down under to keep COVID-19 under control? Global National with Donna Friesen. Good evening and thanks for joining us. It is slowly happening in parts of this country where COVID-19 cases are rising. Public health restrictions are being reimposed. Ontario's Premier announced new rules today that apply across the province. Effective today at midnight, all bars and restaurants will be only permitted to remain open until midnight. All adult entertainment clubs will be closed right across the province. And tomorrow going forward, Restaurant and bars must stop serving alcohol at 11 p.m. and close their establishments by midnight. In Manitoba, the Winnipeg region is moving to code orange in its pandemic response. Starting Monday, masks will be mandatory in all indoor public places and public gatherings indoors and out will be limited to 10 people. Quebec is urging people to restrict their social gatherings to avoid dinners, parties and barbecues for the next 28 days. That province recorded 637 new infections today, the highest daily number since May 21st. Ontario reported more than 400 cases today for the second day in a row. There were almost 100 new cases reported in B.C. and 153 in Alberta. More than 150,000 Canadians have now tested positive for the virus. The rate of testing has accelerated since the spring, but as anyone who has waited in long lines knows, supply is not meeting demand. Rapid tests could be a game changer, and this week Health Canada did quietly approve a new, more rapid test that claims to deliver results in 90 minutes and doesn't require a lab. Eric Sorensen explains. As the lineups for COVID-19 tests grow in Ontario, there's now a backlog of 65,000 test samples, the highest number since the pandemic began. We can have as much testing as you want, but if the lab is unable to process this, then you know we're no further ahead. But one new test could help with that backlog. The makers of the Hyrus B-Cube says their device has been approved by Health Canada. It can test through DNA for COVID-19 with results in 90 minutes. Essentially, a test and a lab all in one box that is portable. It would be a breakthrough for Canada. This is the first point of care device approved in Canada that's truly portable. It's small, you can hold it in your hand. Earlier, Ontario's Premier said he's just waiting for new tests to help with the backlog. Just imagine if we had the rapid test approved that we don't have to go into the labs and uh, because we're, we're short on lab technicians, we maxed out the province. Health Canada plays an absolute critical role in getting these approved. Several types of tests are in the midst of trials. The Prime Minister made it clear there will be no delays once the science at Health Canada declares them effective and safe. If and when uh, rapid tests are approved, we're able to get them uh, distributed rapidly across the country. Um, those are things that we can have ready to go for when uh, an approval hits. In Ontario, pharmacies are now offering tests to cope with the backlog. This woman works in a long-term care facility. It's free and it's safe and it's good and less lineups. Test results still take time. In Ontario and B.C., most results are back in two days. Quebec reports back in one to five days. And Alberta suggests allowing seven to ten days. So new devices and other tests still in trials could be a big help. The B-Cube, for one, is not as accurate as those invasive nose swabs, so there would have to be a follow-up on positive tests, but this could clear out a lot of negative test results. This is great news. Uh, you, you know, we do need to increase testing capacity, and that could be by adding capacity to the current test or bringing in online, uh, bringing online some parallel tests that, that can take the burden off the, the conventional lab tests. The distributor, Songbird Life Science, reportedly hopes to ramp up production to make thousands of the BQ boxes for distribution across Canada. 
Eric Sorensen, Global News, Toronto. There was no mention of that newly approved test when Prime Minister Justin Trudeau held a briefing this morning. The focus was on the longer-term promise of access to a vaccine if a safe and effective one is developed. Abigail Beeman reports. We now have active cases in every single province. Prime Minister stresses the seriousness of a second wave as he makes new commitments for vaccines in development. Canada is buying up to 20 million doses from AstraZeneca and committing another $440 million to the COVAX facility, which pools resources and distribution for vaccines globally between developed and developing countries. This pandemic can't be solved by any one country alone because to eliminate the virus anywhere, we need to eliminate it everywhere. Canada now has deals for six vaccines in development and access to another six through COVAX. The global market for vaccines remains intense and unpredictable. The contractual negotiations are complex. They're not simply a matter of distributing a standard form contract and having suppliers agree to our preferred terms. The federal government is promising safety but isn't making promises on timelines. The AstraZeneca vaccine is in phase three, but clinical trials in the U.S. are still on hold after an unexplained illness in one participant. COVAX's goal is to provide two billion doses by the end of 2021. In total, between all deals, Canada now has access to a guaranteed minimum of 174 million doses. And you'll remember during the height of the first wave, we saw the Prime Minister give daily COVID-19 updates. Now facing a second wave, his office confirms to Global News we can expect to see more of Justin Trudeau in the coming days, giving more COVID-19 updates. Abigail Beeman, Global News, Ottawa. Justin Trudeau has a minority government, and today it got the support it appears to need from the New Democrats to survive a confidence vote on the throne speech. The NDP tells Global News they have a deal with the Liberals, including to massively expand the number of Canadians who can access sick days. One of the promises in the throne speech is a big investment in child care. A national child care program is not a new idea. It's just never been delivered. And lots of details are missing from this promise, like how much will be invested and where the money will come from. Tonight, Mike Lecouture has a reality check. Access to more affordable, accessible and high quality and inclusive childcare. The idea of a national childcare system was first floated back in the early 1990s. Now, it's the Trudeau Liberals' turn. The minister in charge of families admits it won't happen overnight. This is something we're committed to and it is something that's going to take a number of years, although we are very much committed to showing early progress by creating additional affordable spaces. Ottawa and the provinces already agreed to an early learning and child care framework. In the throne speech, the government signaled it would learn from Quebec's model, which is considered the gold standard. According to a study from the University of Quebec in Montreal, the total cost of direct and indirect subsidies to all types of child care in that province last year was $2.9 billion, representing less than 1% of Quebec's GDP. Using those same metrics, it would cost $10 billion and the same proportion of Canada's GDP for a program covering other provinces excluding Quebec. But economists point out the Quebec program pays for itself. For every $100 in subsidized care in Quebec, the Quebec government got $104 in new provincial income taxes. Hi, Aaron. Those benefits come in the form of reintegrating women into the workforce. The one problem with the Quebec system, according to those who have studied it, is that it's two-tiered. Non-profit um, early childhood centers uh, are uh, highly, they, they get very high marks uh, throughout the world in terms of uh, the level of quality. So on the other hand, the private for-profit sector is not as good. And that's one of the reasons why the Conservatives are against a national system. And if you're giving parents more money back in their pockets, they're better able to choose what is best in their situation. The government says it will study all options available, but Minister Hoosen said we could get some of the costing details in the fall fiscal update. Mike LeCouture, Global News, Ottawa. 
An Ontario man who claimed he had conducted executions for the so-called Islamic State is facing the rare charge of faking his involvement with a terrorist group. The 25-year-old has been identified by sources as the same man who featured in a New York Times podcast called Caliphate. In that podcast, he claimed he carried out executions for ISIS in Syria and then returned home to Canada a free man. The RCMP now say he made it up. He's been arrested and charged. Our chief investigative correspondent, Carolyn Jarvis, joins me from Toronto with the details. Caroline. Donna, until now, he's only gone by the alias Abu Huzaifa, but now we're able to share his real name, Shiroz Chowdhury, a man who's been charged with committing a terrorism hoax. And a warning, some of the excerpts from the podcast you're about to hear are graphic and disturbing. After that, I stabbed him. The blood was just, it was warm and it sprayed everywhere. His gruesome, detailed confessions of execution-style murders were heard around the world. What are we going to call him? The Canadian? He wants us to call him Abu Huzaifa. Known only by his alias, we can now show you what he looks like and share his real name, Shiroz Chowdhury, a man from Burlington, Ontario, who's facing a charge of committing a terrorism hoax meaning some or all of his grisly account of traveling to Syria and joining the so-called Islamic State may be a lie. We put him up on a cross and I had to leave the dagger in his heart. Chowdhury caused a firestorm in Ottawa when politicians believed a terrorist had returned to Canada without arrest. Canadians deserve more answers from this government. Absolutely. Why aren't they doing something about this despicable animal? Yeah. Yeah. The facts in Chowdhury's story changed as he spoke with different reporters, including Global News, to whom he claimed he served in ISIS, but didn't kill anyone. I need to figure out, is he for real? The Caliphate podcast produced by the New York Times found holes in Huzaifa's story, but said two officials in the U.S. government, as well as an ISIS source, confirmed he was a member of ISIS in Syria. If he's found guilty of committing a terrorism hoax, Chowdhury could face up to five years in jail. They will have to show that exactly that because of the hoax, that it's creating fear that these individuals aren't being prosecuted, that our security services can't do their jobs, uh, that people should fear that ISIS fighters are returning and running around. We reached out to the New York Times for comment late today, but didn't hear back by our deadline. Chowdhury is scheduled to appear in court in November. Donna? Carolyn Jarvis in Toronto, thanks. In Paris, France, a stabbing that seriously injured two people is being treated as an act of terrorism. The victims, a man and a woman, worked at a documentary production company and they were near the former offices of Charlie Hebdo. Two suspects have been arrested. In 2015, 12 people were gunned down when Islamic extremists targeted the office of the French satirical newspaper. The publication had reprinted a depiction recently of the Prophet Muhammad, something many consider offensive in Islam. Many Americans are voting early and eagerly. I would walk through glass and hot charcoal and bare feet to make, to make this election. Next, what's driving people to the polls? In the U.S., the late U.S. Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg made history again today. Her flag-draped coffin was carried into the U.S. Capitol, where it lay in state as mourners paid their respects. Ginsburg is the first woman and the first Jewish person in American history to be honored this way. And late today, American media outlets are reporting President Trump intends to nominate Judge Amy Coney Barrett to fill Ruth Bader Ginsburg's seat on the U.S. Supreme Court. The political battle over that seat is one factor driving Americans to the polls. The election isn't until November 3rd, but early voting has already begun in many states, and there are long lines at polling stations. Jackson Prosco went to Virginia and found Americans highly motivated to vote. More than five weeks before the election, and this is the line for early voting in Northern Virginia. I think Trump's the motivating factor. I want to make sure my vote gets counted. It's been like this every day since the polls opened. Fairfax County typically sees high turnout, but nothing like this. Right now, uh, we're anticipating a 90% a turnout for Fairfax County. Most will vote early, in person or by mail. We want to make sure the election is honest, and I'm not sure that it can be. Each time the president casts doubt about the outcome, the more people seem to rush to the polls. There is a lot of anxiety, right, and uh, 
If you just do the right thing, I think the anxiety will be kind of reduced. Daily developments from the pandemic to the courts only add to the urgency. It's a very high stakes election year and it's my first time voting. And Siblings so Steve and uh, Sally really Jones came here after the sudden death of Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Make sure that we grant the last wish of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, which was to not be replaced until there's a new president in office. This is amazing to me. Supporters of President Donald Trump are just as anxious about the outcome. He's done great for the country thus far, and I want him to continue to do so. Some form of early voting is now underway in more than two dozen states. Nearly half of eligible voters say they plan to vote before November 3rd. I would walk through glass and hot charcoal and bare feet to make, to make this election. I want my country back. The result is that by election day, in many counties, a majority may have already cast their ballots, leaving the candidates little room to change minds in the final weeks of the campaign. Jackson Prosco, Global News, Fairfax County, Virginia. The family of Breonna Taylor is demanding the release of transcripts of the grand jury decision not to charge any police officers directly with her death. She was shot multiple times by police in her own home. Today, her aunt read an emotional message from the 26-year-old's mother. I hope you never know the pain of your child being murdered 191 days in a row. I am an angry black woman. Yeah. Hey. I am not angry for the reasons that you would like me to be, right. but angry because our black women keep dying at the hands of police officers. Mm. Whoa, 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 whoa. At least two dozen people were arrested last night in Louisville, Kentucky, during another round of protests. In Los Angeles, a protester was struck by a pickup truck suffering minor injuries. In March, plainclothes police officers burst into Taylor's home as part of a botched drug investigation. She was shot and killed. No drugs were found. Her family is leading a march through downtown Louisville tonight. The mayor has appealed for calm. Pregnant princess still ahead, a royal baby announcement. Canadian students from coast to coast to coast held socially distant rallies today. They're disappointed by what they believe is the federal government's inaction on climate change promises, such as curbing greenhouse gas emissions and planting two billion trees. September 25th is considered a global day of action and marks the anniversary of the 2019 global climate strike organized by Swedish activist Greta Thunberg. And this 18-year-old British Greenpeace activist staged a protest on an ice floe hundreds of kilometers above the Arctic Circle. This year's Arctic sea ice cover shrank to the second lowest it's been since record-keeping began four decades ago. Well, she's not in dire straits, far from it, but Queen Elizabeth is facing a financial shortfall because of the pandemic. Each year, the royal household opens its accounting books to show how it has spent public money, and in part because of a far fewer tourists at royal palaces, the bank account will be down roughly $25 million over the next three years. Buckingham Palace has already put a freeze on staff pay and on new hiring and is looking for other ways to cut costs. And one of the Queen's granddaughters, Princess Eugenie, has announced she's expecting a baby. She and her husband were married two years ago in the chapel on the grounds of Windsor Castle. Their child, due in early 2021, will be the Queen's ninth great-grandchild. The world's strictest lockdown next. Lessons from Canadians under curfew in Australia. It's just a sad fact that we're all going to be living with this pandemic for some time to come. The best we can do is listen to the public health advice and observe how other countries have handled their outbreaks. Australia had to put another strict lockdown in place in Melbourne. Our Mike Drolet spoke to some Canadians living down under about the lessons learned. It's after Melbourne's 9 p.m. curfew and nary a soul is to be seen. Proof what are being called the most draconian COVID-19 measures in the world seem to be working. 75% of Australia's 26,000 COVID-19 cases have occurred in Victoria State, where Melbourne is the capital. In late June, a second wave forced the government to take drastic action. So Canadian expats like Daniela Minicucci had to give up freedom of movement. Well, we're not able to go further than five kilometers unless you're breaking the rules, which of course we're not. She'd love nothing more than to go to the beach, but it's just outside her travel zone. 
Residents can go outside for two hours a day, but that's it. Melbourne is so locked down, it's become an island in an island country. Protests were also deemed illegal, but when Melburnians tried anyway, police were there to arrest them. Epidemiologists say Canadians should take note, especially if numbers continue to rise in Ontario and Quebec. It may come to that, but let's try and avoid that by hanging on to the faith, hope and charity of the distancing, masking and hand hygiene. We spoke with another Canadian living in Australia, Alex Newman, five days after leaving Melbourne for a new job in Sydney. Can't open this for too long. Let's see. Okay, so there we go. That is, that is the lunch. Sydney isn't taking risks with anybody coming from the hot zone. So Newman has to quarantine in a hotel room where the windows don't open and there's a guard on every floor. So I have a, a roast beef sandwich. He has to pay for the room. The government supplies the food. And it doesn't always seem like a fair deal. I, I don't want to say it's prison-like because, you know, I have a, a decent room, some light and a bed, but it, I can't help but feel like a little prison-like. <laughs> It hasn't been easy, but Newman and Minikuchi are trying to stay positive in their adoptive country. It's, you just, I mean, what can you do? Like, if the alternative is a situation like America, no thanks. So they're riding out the storm. The payoff, hopefully, is an Australian summer without any COVID-19 worries. Mike Drolet, Global News, Toronto. And that is Global National for this Friday. I'm Donna Friesen. Tonight's Your Canada is this beautiful autumn scene in Bonneville, Alberta. We'd love to see Your Canada. Please email it to viewers at globalnational.com. Thanks for watching. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye.